Hey, everybody. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of the Art of Intervention Project. Today, we get to speak with Lori Leonard, and we're gonna, we do this project as a resource for families and for professionals. And so, Lori, thanks for spending a little bit of time with me. Can you give the listeners or viewers, depending on where you're tapping in from, kind of, uh, you know, who, who is Lori? Thank you very much. Um, I'm Lori Leonard. I'm a licensed clinical social worker. Um, I have um, been in the field of mental health and substance abuse since I graduated with my undergrad in, in when I was 22. Um, since then, I have worked in substance abuse prevention in the school system. I have worked in substance abuse research at the University of Health Sciences in New Mexico and New Mexico Hospital, um, doing motivational interviewing research type of stuff. Um, I've worked in psychiatric treatment and substance abuse treatment. And about, I don't know, I'm thinking, has it been 10, 11 years ago? I just landed with thinking that, you know, I don't know if I want to work directly, directly with, with that people who are addicted, the addicts or the person of concern, but I really felt a passion to do family work. And my own upbringing, um, I come from a family with a lot of addiction. Um, thank God, you know, knock on wood, um, most of my primary family members are in active recovery now, so that's amazing. But I really, you know, can understand and relate to how um, family members go through the process of loving someone who's suffering from addiction. And so I decided that, you know, I was going to really focus on getting people into treatment. But that, of course, is the, the first step and goal. But the secondary and I think the most primary goal for my work is really beginning the transformation and family recovery and healing for family members. I love it. Yeah, transformation is such a big part of this. And as you said, it's a process, right? Mm -hmm. and, and the art of intervention stands for addiction, recovery, transformation, and you just hit all those words in your introduction and everything there, right? And, and you definitely have a well-rounded background of seeing it from all sorts of different angles. So, um, but I, the question comes up sometimes, you know, well, is my loved one addicted? So how do you even describe addiction from the, all those vantage points that you've been a part of in your career? Well, I mean, I have intervened on clients that are clearly meeting that, you know, um, addicted substance abuse dependent criteria. And then I have seen, you know, those families who kind of, you know, go from zero to 10 real quick and are maybe a little bit more overreactive. And we have someone who's definitely abusing substances. So, so I do think there's a continuum, but what I look at it and when, you know, determining, okay, this person needs an intervention is one, is this impacting the person's life negatively, right? Is it impacting their, their relationships, their work, their being their best selves? And has it, you know, since the substances have become part of their life, has the family seen a change, right? And so if we can look at that and go, yes. Um, and, and then, and then I look at, of course, you know, if, you wouldn't need an intervention if the person said, hey, yeah, 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 I, I want to change. I want to go get help. Yeah, yeah, sign me up for whatever it takes. So, you know, that's kind of the, the second component. But when I go into an intervention, I don't, and I tell the family this, like we don't, you know, if we write letters or we are talking to the person, we're not the one to determine that they're addicted right? We don't have to call them the A word, right? Which, which, which will obviously bring, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, we, we can talk about their behaviors and our feelings about those behaviors and our concerns, but it's really up to the person once they hopefully enter some kind of treatment and, you know, begin to look at themselves to determine, yes, you know, is substance abuse a real problem for me? That's, that's their own story. And I'm not one for labels either, but yeah, well, they say, you know, um, someone says, am I an addict? It's like, well, a lot of times if you're asking the question, it's possible there might be a dependency. But what I hear you saying, correct me if I'm wrong, is that every phone call that comes in does not necessarily turn into a full-blown intervention. No, exactly. And, and I'm not a real salesy person. Like I'm not, I don't believe in that kind of put pressure on, let's do an intervention tomorrow, get them into treatment. Um, you know, one of the things that I'm always going to ask people is I'm like, have you talked to your loved one? And when you talk to them and you say, hey, I'm concerned, I think you might need some help, how do they respond? Because it's, it's kind of crazy, but some of the times when I ask that question, people say, no, I haven't. And I'm like, well, so we're gonna go from zero to 10, 
And they're going to probably say, why did you bring all these people in? And all you could have done is talk to me, which of course, most of the time they have talked, they've nagged, they've done everything in, you know, trying to control and, and get someone some help and it hasn't worked. But I have to ask that question one, because I want to, you know, know that they have, and I want to coach them to give it a shot if they have it. And a lot of times, of course, we're going to get what we typically would expect some defensiveness and and then we can still go to the intervention but i also want to know you know it helps me to know where's this person's level of change at you know are they a little bit open can they you know admit or talk about it or are they just pure out denial right yeah it's great because again sometimes families don't even ask the question like well i'm just afraid of what will happen and they're gonna be mad if i say anything so well how do you know if you don't ask then you can kind of move into this because this intervention process is it's a process right and, and you talk about um well let's just talk about it so the phone rings and you've kind of answered some of these questions already how you would engage the family to say okay let's see what's going on and then let's say you decide we do need to do like this is a crisis moment we do need to do an intervention what would the family expect from that phone call to say like walk us through to the day of the intervention yeah. Uh, first of all, you know, with my background, a clinical background, I want to get as much information about the client from as many collateral resources as I can. Because sometimes, you know, families, you know, have a lot of information. Sometimes they know nothing about mental health or addiction. Sometimes the call, we don't even know, the family's not even sure what substance they're using or how much, or if this is like drug-induced psychosis or, you know, substance abuse related. So I'm trying to figure out all that as much as possible because I want to know this person. And I want to make the best fit recommendations for treatment. And so, you know, that's, that's part of why I do that assessment. So I can get someone into the right place. And, you know, I, I pride myself on not getting people into the wrong place where they have to be moved. Haven't had that happen in years. Um, Cause that's no good for the family or the client or myself. Um, so, you know, from there, we're going to talk about um, who, you know, who's the right people to involve. And, and you know, I kind of have three kind of criteria is, you know, anyone that your family member loves or respects, um, anyone that is, you know, concerned and loves your person of concern, the person we're concerned about. Um, and, and, you know, we don't want to bring into the intervention anyone who is actively using with them or has an active substance abuse issue as kind of the same level or worse for sure. Um, you know, I mean, sometimes you can bring in people who've used with them, of course, but um, we got to kind of tease that out. Um, and anyone that has, you know, some extreme tension with them, we want this to be a really supportive group. So we look at who's going to participate. I want to, you know, get their contact information, have, you know, some, some outreach with them. And then from there, you know, we're going to kind of look at where they're going to go to treatment. When is this going to happen? Um, we're going to have lots of calls in the planning process. You know, it's it, the intervention itself is is a two day process, and that I wherever the family is, we're going to have a very long planning family training session the day before. Um, I used to be, I, I I think I'm more kind of family systemic, but I know that the family when they're about to do an intervention, they only have so much tolerance to do so much kind of education and training. Right? They're just kind of like, oh, get them in treatment. They're yeah. In no. So I give them as much as they can tolerate and then follow up on the back end with more of that kind of continuing family education around codependency, enabling addiction, family recovery, recovery, all that stuff. Um, so they'll get that and then we'll do the intervention the next day. And that's kind of typically how it works. Take the person to treatment. If the person doesn't go to treatment, then we're going to have a following kind of debrief session with a lot more, okay, now what happens? Just because they didn't go doesn't mean we're giving up. No, here's now the next steps we're taking. So there's kind of a follow-up training in that scenario. Um, and then from there, you know, we're going to, I'm going to follow the person while they're in treatment and continue to work with that family generally for six months. Sometimes families engage longer than that. But I want to see that person go to treatment, have a solid aftercare plan, and then, you know, kind of transition home or back to life, you know, get that kind of six month, hopefully six months of recovery. Or if there's a relapse, you know, I'm there for the family. Yeah, that's great. So plan B then is already kind of laid out in a sense with the family that, hey, if plan A doesn't work, they completely refuse treatment and they're done. And plan B is 
is kind of already laid out for them in their minds. So when you have that follow-up conversation, they kind of know what to expect too, right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So how do you determine what is a good treatment center to refer people to? So, um, you know, of course, there's a lot of um, words being thrown around in the treatment industry, co-occurring, dual diagnosis, trauma, you know, all of that. Um, you know, I just really want to make sure whatever the client is dealing with, um, that treatment center can, can meet their needs, you know, and so looking at that, sometimes we're also looking at location as a factor, you know, if somebody is got a, a bad girlfriend, boyfriend, you know, some kind of people they're running around, they may need to get a little further away from home just to kind of help them focus on themselves and remain in treatment. Um, of course, also I'm looking at people, you know, treatment centers track records, you know, um, are they ethical? Um, have I had good experience with them? Do they communicate well with referral sources and, um, and families? Because that helps me if, if the family's not hearing any updates and I'm not hearing any updates, then that's not a good thing. So, you know, and a lot of that is just kind of relationships I've, I've built over the years with, with trusted um, colleagues from treatment centers. And that said, though, I am fully independent, no, no kickbacks, no, you know, nothing. When I make a referral, it's not because a treatment center refers to me. Um, it's really about what is going to give that family and that loved one the best shot at recovery because the families are, you know, they are just really struggling. They're spending so much financial resources, time, emotional energy on this that, you know, let's get them into treatment with the best set. And then of course, I'm looking at the current milieu of the treatment center. You know, if I've got a 65 year old woman and it's a small women's center and everyone else is between 20 and 30, that's not going to be a good fit either. Yeah, it's good. Commonality helps with recovery a lot of times, even though we have that same, that same core thing that something's missing, which is why, you know, we're using substances along the way too. And before we started talking earlier, we talked a lot about um, recovery coaching and the family. So let's talk about what does that look like? The, uh, the word recovery specifically first, what do, you, what do you think when you think of the word recovery? Well, I think to, to recover from anything is, in my mind, is, is to overcome something, you know, um, to, to actively be working on something that I need to overcome. And, you know, for the client, it may be their coping mechanisms and using substances to, to cope with daily life. And for the family, it may be their enabling and codependency behaviors, right? Um, and I do this exercise, um, I do two, a couple of family programs for various treatment centers here locally. And, you know, we do this exercise, it's called the HELPS exercise. We look at, you know, how does addiction impact our loved ones, the person with addiction? How does addiction impact the family? And, you know, we switch it around and, and then we look at, okay, how does it affect the family's health, mental health, their economics? Is there any legal issues? You know, we've had people had to change their wills and, you know, had to, they're getting divorced, whatever, uh, their personal relationships and their spirituality. And the interesting thing, and we just kind of, you know, jot, jot this all over, you know, on like a, a piece of, uh, you know, big poster board. And, it, it, one side is the same as the other side, right? And so when we look at, you know, the families aren't sleeping, they're depressed, they're not concentrating at work. Maybe they even passed over a promotion because they didn't feel like they could travel or something for work. Um, their economics are being affected, right? They're spending money on treatment and all this stuff, legal lawyers, all this stuff, right? Or their loved ones are stealing from them, whatever. Um, so when we, we look at that, you know, I try to show families like you have to recover as well. You've been trying to control this over here. That's not working. So let's focus on what you do have power to control. Right. And so in family recovery coaching um, and some of the some of the people that I do this coaching with, I didn't do interventions with their families. Right. I just kind of got them from a treatment center referral or they reached out to me or I met them through my family program that I did and they have someone in new recovery and they realize they're gonna need some guidance. How do we change our behaviors? What do we do when Johnny calls and, and you know, 
has had a relapse or wants us to sign a lease on an apartment or, you know, should we give the car back or this or that or, you know. And so that is really in the moment. The coaching is in the moment type of coaching. So it's not like a 50 minute session that we schedule every week and maybe you come to the session with stuff to talk about or maybe you don't. It's like my family's, you know, kind of purchased a set of hours and we go in real time. You know, it's like they can text me and say, hey, do you have a moment to talk? We're feeling anxious about this, right? And with that coaching too, if they haven't done an intervention with me, I'm gonna do some training as well. But the transformation, and I guess I'm using that word again, yeah. it, I, I see the families that I've coached over time, you know, maybe I have one um, that I've worked with for almost three years now off and on, I can see their progress. Whereas before I'm spoon feeding them, okay, say this to Johnny. And, and now they're saying, this is what I said to him. This is how I felt that. What do you think, Lori? You know, um, they're recognizing the feelings that they have in the moments that is their own stuff and how it relates to how they interact with their loved one and their codependency and enabling. So yeah, it's their own patterns. That's great. And again, on the fly. I mean, that's what recovery is about. A lot of times it's like, ah, moment. I don't know what to do. And when they, when they reach out and they can't get a hold of you, it gives them time to process. Okay. What have I learned from Lori? Okay. I mean, exactly. I, yeah. And, and sometimes I, I try to have decent boundaries. I mean, a, a lot of people in, in the, you know, this whole recovery industry, we, we lack our boundaries. Sometimes we're kind of like, we, uh, we got to respond, you know, and, and sometimes, you know, if someone texts me and say, Hey, you know, um, can you talk? And it's 1030 at night. And I'm like, I can, I'm, I'm free in the morning. You know, I can talk at, you know, 830 or nine. And some, if it's really, it's really not a true crisis, it might feel like a crisis to them because they're uncomfortable, but sometimes that's what they need. And the next morning when I talk to them, you know, they'll even say, you know, I'm glad we didn't talk last night. I'm in a much better place. Now I can look at this a little differently and we can begin talking. So they can kind of sit with that discomfort and not feel like they have to react because a lot of times they don't have to take action or make a decision in that moment. Well, a lot of this, it, it is a reactive state until people learn how to respond. So, right, they, the phone call initially comes and says, hey, we need intervention. We're in crisis mode, we're reacting, right? And then you teach them from what I'm hearing is how to respond to the situation so it's not such a crisis the next time that things kind of come down the pipeline. And and you work a lot with, I know you know a lot of other interventionists around the world because of NII. We tell people a little bit about what NII, NII is. Yeah, so it's an organization, a professional ethical organization for interventionists. And it's similar to AIS, um, actually, you know, several years ago, or I guess more than 10 years ago, AIS and um, kind of some members of AIS split and formed a um, network of independent interventionists. And, um, you know, the purpose of network of independent interventionists was to truly kind of increase the bar on the professionalism and ethics of interventionists. Um, to be a part of our group a little bit different than AIS is you cannot work or be tied to or own a and have financial ties to a treatment center or recovery resource. I mean, there are people like me that maybe do a little bit of consulting, we do some speaking, we do some trainings, we may do some family programs, but there is, we have to be fully independent, right? That there is no, I'm, you know, getting kickbacks or paid. I mean, I know all this stuff is illegal, but somewhat still happening. Um, so it really kind of was upping the bar. Also, we require, you know, people to, um, we want them to either have some kind of certification in substance abuse. A lot of our um, members actually have PhDs or master level, um, you know, in mental health or substance abuse. So they're really a very broad group of people who have a lot of training and a lot of experience. And, you know, like AIS, we have conferences um, where we do, you know, training and network, but it, and we also have been doing Zoom meetings recently, you know, where we'll have somebody share a case or somebody, um, you know, kind of have a topic and we'll all share our information because this can be a lonely field. And I think the more that we can learn from each other and hold each other accountable and support each other, I think it's really important. 
Very good. Hey guys, we're, if you're just tuning in, we're talking to Lori Leonard over at Hope Interventions, which is the website's hopeinterventionstx.com because Lori's down in Austin, Texas, I'm assuming. Or would TX stand for treatment? I know some people think that, but um, it is it is for Texas. I, I being in Texas, Texas is a big state. I do a lot of interventions all across Texas. I do do some work nationally as well. That's great because again, your your background, your history, your all you're all over the place. I know you're you're a very busy interventionist, but I believe that each one of your clients feels like they're the only client that you have at the time. Well, that's a huge compliment. I hope to make them um, feel like that, that they can know that, you know, I'm, once they engage with me, that I am going to be there and walk them through the whole process, right? And not just go MIA or disappear after the first person gets the treatment because, you know, that's, that's maybe their primary goal for, for calling me. And a lot of times they have this kind of headspace of, well, once they go to treatment, it'll all be fixed and, you know, I don't have to worry about anything else. Um, but we know, we, we know that's not the case. Yeah, well, and what you do in, in this whole process, it gives everyone the same language, right? It gives the family the same language of addiction and recovery and treatment and transformation, and it gives the loved one the same language so they can kind of understand each other more in this process. So um, going back to kind of like the initial call, someone calls you up, they found you by a referral or your website or however they found you. What are some questions you would encourage families to ask an interventionist that they're calling for help? Um, you know, what approach do they take, right? What, which model do they use? How long have they been doing interventions? What credentials they have, you know? I mean, really, we are one of the few, I, I mean, there's, we're not licensed, right? I mean, you can call yourself an interventionist without any real background. I mean, some people have the CIP, but a lot of people don't have anything. And I think now too, I, for me, I also tell families, you know, they'll tell me that they're, you know, they're dealing with their daughter and she's got trauma and she's got a history of eating disorder and mental health, you know, and they'll be saying, well, we're talking to you and another interventionist. And oftentimes that interventionist is male because there's more males than females. And, and I think, you know, too, in, in choosing a gender, sometimes that, that does into it. And if you're dealing with somebody who's got more kind of, you know, complex background, I think you should have somebody that is experienced in mental health. Like what is their background, right? And, and what do they do if they don't go to treatment, right? And how long do they follow up with the family? And what does that follow up look like? Because sometimes people say they follow up, but then you maybe hear from them one time in six months after the intervention, right? Do they, do they stay involved with the, you know, treatment centers getting updates, right? Do they help the person if they want to leave treatment early, right? AMA or ACA, what do they do in that case? Are they there for you? Do they help with aftercare planning? I think those are all really important questions. Uh, another great reason to call an interventionist and, and again, you're finding someone to help your loved one. So calling one and if it's the right fit, it's the right fit. If not, you know, find someone else or keep asking around questions. And the other great value of using someone like yourself is making sure that the treatment center, like you said, does what they do. Cause I see yeah. some treatment centers out there and they'll say, well, we work with the LGBTQ community, but really they don't. They're just trying to attract more people because they don't have like a special program. It's just like, well, we'll just deal with them individually. Or, you know, we have a Christian track, which is basically a Bible in one celebrate recovery meeting, but they don't address it from a biblical perspective. And so I guess maybe you talk about that a little bit. Like if people are just out there doing their research on a treatment center, what should they look for? Or how should they, how should they um, interview a treatment center? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm going to be an advocate for the family, and families can get really overwhelmed, especially when they treatment shop. You know, sometimes we have, they're, they're looking and they're Googling and they're, you know, and, and these places have these beautiful websites, and, and they say they have, um, they do all of these different therapies, like they hit every single possible modality, and equine therapy, and this and this and this, you know, and so I really 
I really do want the family to align with me and build some rapport with me so that they can trust me and that the recommendations, I know I'm gonna give them three, four or five recommendations and then help them look at that. And then we'll come together and talk about the pros and cons because there's always gonna be pros and cons. And the other thing I want families to know is that you know I'm gonna take into account your financial situation because I don't ever, I wanna advocate for you and I don't ever want a family you know, to go, this is the first treatment episode and okay, let's spend 75, $100,000 on treatment and just kind of wipe out our, our savings in 401k or whatever. And because we know that the loved one may need longer treatment. And I think saving some money on the back end, you know, for that sober living, that aftercare, that extended care, whatever that all they're going to need is really important. And if people need to use insurance, we'll, we'll do the best that we can to, to work with that and kind of extend out that continuum of care for, for their loved ones. So financial is going to um, take take in, um, a piece to it, and I think also you know what I say about finding an interventionist and when you talk to the treatment center, a lot of it's about your own intuition. Who makes you feel comfortable, right? Does the treatment center on the phone are they listening to you or are they just checking boxes and then trying to sell you something, right? And and families they they feel that, and I think it's the same with interventionists. It's like is this somebody that really here's my story and, you know, is listening and giving me some good feedback um, and not overly pushy, you know, um, I think that that comfort level for interventionist and treatment, you've got to feel comfortable, right? Um, and, and then, you know, we want to make sure that their loved one, you can see your loved one there. Um, because sometimes, you know, if we send someone to a location that's not up to their standards and all they're going to do is complain about the food and their bed and their pillow, then they're not going to be able to engage, engage in treatment, right? Um, you know, so, so we're looking at all of those factors and a help family with that. That's great. Well, thank you so much. I mean, this is all great information for everybody out there. And I was saying there's people are listening right now and they're on that bubble of, they've already come up with the objections in their head that their loved one's going to say to not go to treatment. What are some of the, I guess, most common objections you hear from the loved one, why they cannot go to treatment if they really need it. I mean, obviously you said that it's not always going to a program, but something to bring change. Yeah. So in the pre-planning meeting and training, we're going to look at, you know, how, how do you think your loved one's going to react? What is going to be their objections? What's going to be the barriers to them entering treatment today? You know, of course there's job pets, surprisingly can't leave my dog or my cat are huge. Children are huge. Um, you know, I'm too busy. Uh, oftentimes not a reality, but, um, they view it as such, um, money, um, you know, something that's an event that's coming up, you know, maybe it's a trip or a wedding, you know, so, so we're going to really look at all of those and, you know, basically know in advance how we're going to respond to that. Because, you know, we, we want to, I guess it's, we want to convince your loved one that there is nothing more important than going to get help today, right? Today, there's nothing that should be more important they deserve help they deserve to be happy and that needs to happen today right and it's important to the family members too the family members have to also express how much it means to them right that their loved one seeks help yeah has a loved one as a member of the family okay we're addressing loved one but then another member that's part of this intervention how often have you seen hmm maybe i need to go to treatment too yeah, I think it's an opportunity for all the participants to begin to look at their own behaviors and stuff. And I've had quite a few family members um, enter some kind of treatment or getting help for themselves after an intervention because it just kind of takes the band-aid off the whole family, you know, the family secrets, whatever's been going on. So sometimes, a, you know, a spouse or a parent will go get help, um, you know, doing something like an intensive, you know, where they can go to, through uh, family of origin stuff or their own trauma work or, or codependency, or sometimes they begin to go, you know what, I need to cut down on drinking and using too, you know, and we talk about as well, like, obviously, maybe we're concerned about the person we're intervening on, 
but how likely or how much more would it help if the whole family got help? Right. If the whole family began to, you know, reduce their substance use or get healthy, how much more likely would the loved one be able to come back into that environment and enter into long term sobriety? Right? Great. And a lot of times that's the motivating factor. Right. It's like, OK, well, I'll do it for her. Right. If that means that she's going to likely, you know, get better. Yeah. Right, yeah. Yeah. Definitely. I'll do it for you. So. Um, so kind of last words of encouragement to someone that's listening and they are just afraid to make that phone call. Yeah. I mean, there is a lot of things to consider in doing an intervention. And I think the, the hardest part and the scariest part for people in, in actually making that decision to do an intervention is they're afraid. They're afraid that their person is going to get mad at them and that the person is going to feel betrayed. And in my experience, the person may go off to treatment and be very, you know, upset that day, but they don't stay angry. You know, as they begin to enter their own treatment, they begin to see, wow, you know, my family cared enough about me to do this. Wow, I didn't feel so loved or cared about, right? I have had some clients say that the intervention was the best day of their life, which was pretty remarkable, right? Um, you know, because maybe that same day they didn't feel that way. And I think the second thing that families are the most afraid about is it will work, right? There's always a naysayer in the group that says, this is going to be a waste. We're going to do all this, spend all this money, and it's not going to work. And I know that's a fear because families have been struggling with this a long time, but intervention, if done right, it works. And I believe a successful intervention isn't necessarily someone going to treatment that day, although about 85, 90% do, you know, it's the beginning of the family transforming. And if the family continues to do their work, likely that person is going to get help. Maybe not the day of intervention, maybe two days later, maybe a month or four months later, but they will. And the family also begins to make changes and heals. So um, I just, I believe in the power of this work and I hope families can, can make that first call and, and see that it's not such a scary process if you, you know, work with someone that you feel very comfortable with. Yeah, well, if nothing happens, nothing happens, right? Things just stay the same or get worse. So how do people connect with you? Um, so, you know, they can reach me on my website. Um, also calling me on my, my phone number. I don't know if you want me to give that out. Um, it's 512-222-6986. That is my business cell phone. Um, people can also text that number. And I'm pretty responsive unless I'm in the middle of an intervention or on a plane. You know, I'll respond uh, the same day generally to, to families in need. And even if somebody isn't sure they need an intervention, you know, I always like to you know, give them referrals, you know, and help them out, coach them a little bit, you know, I always do an initial consult with no charge for people. There you go. That's very kind of you. So, well, thanks for your time today, Lori. I love everything you shared and I'm sure our audience and viewers and guests uh, loved it as well. So guys, if reach out to Lori, get some advice, help your loved one, take action today because we don't know what tomorrow looks like. Exactly. Thanks everybody. Have a good day, everybody. Thank you.